I do that to sync up the audio. There's a reason for it. It's not just to like psych myself up. We're talking about Acts chapter 8 verses 9 through 25. In the last episode, we worked through that very long passage in excruciating detail. And now we're back to pick up the observations and some of the big picture things about the passage. I've got four big observations about this passage. Number one, we see that once again, God is absolutely committed to sticking with this church. He promised it in Matthew 28. Jesus said, I'll be with you always, even till the end of the age. The Holy Spirit showed up and we've seen God through the Holy Spirit affirming again and again, hey, I'm with you. I've got your back. I'm going to see this thing through. And we've seen God protect the church from threats inside and out. Threats to its internal health as well as its external credibility and reputation. We learn from the very difficult incident with Ananias and Sapphira that this church thing is not a scam to get money out of people. And now we've also learned that this thing isn't about power or prestige based on the example of Simon and the rebuke that he got for trying to exploit it for those purposes. I don't think God has to jump in these days every time Christians like me want to do something stupid or say something stupid or post dumb crap on the internet like we do sometimes because the church is established well enough that we don't need miraculous protection from our own stupidity all the time. I think we're at a place where God's track record speaks for itself. Bible kind of speaks for itself. We have a Bible. And so the reputation is sort of upheld by what God has already done. And there have been zillions of brilliant, fantastic Christians from all different denominations and persuasions all over the world over the last 2,000 years that make a strong case for the reality of God's work in people's lives. Yep, there's also several of us who can be gigantic idiots and say and do things that we hugely regret. But we're not in a place where the church is incredibly vulnerable and weak and in danger of falling apart should our reputation in our immediate community get bad because of dumb stuff that we did or because we missed the point. So I think we have a unique moment in history that we're looking at here where God is uniquely going out of his way to protect the reputation, the credibility, and the internal health of his church. A second observation, we see narrative progress that is a big leap forward. We've pretty much just been in Jerusalem this whole time up through chapter 8. And it didn't seem like things were going very well, but there's sort of a last-ditch effort. Stephen comes and takes a stab at explaining everything, and it goes badly and is received poorly, and he ends up being stoned, and things kind of fall apart in Jerusalem for the time being. So right now, it looks like if the story is going to continue, it needs to continue somewhere other than Jerusalem. But how's that going to go? I mean, Jerusalem is where Jesus died and was resurrected. And like everybody from the church is in Jerusalem right now. Well, then we have this scattering. And now we see this message going out to, of all places, Samaria, which you would think would be like the worst place to take the message. But that's what God prompts Philip to do. And it totally works out. Which means that through some pretty weird circumstances, we're seeing the story advance the way Jesus said the story was supposed to advance. And we're starting to see the message go out to people who look a little less Jewish and a little bit more like the Gentiles. And this is sort of a halfway step toward the God of Abraham demonstrating his love and message of redemption to everybody. That, to us, is old news. At this moment was a sea change, the likes of which had never been seen in this religious tradition. A third observation. Simon made one key fundamental mistake. He missed the point of the miracles and prioritized the miraculous over the one who provided the miraculous. Now, interestingly, all the people who had followed him got this the right way. They responded to the message about Jesus and the kingdom that Philip was talking about. And all of the miraculous stuff just helped point to that. But for Simon, it was always about the sensational, the mysterious, the, the arcane. And so he was all excited about all of that. And yeah, there's some uh, Jesus stuff or something in there too. And I'm, I'm sure that was terribly, terribly important. But tell me how to get more of the power. He just wants to cut to the chase. I don't want the God stuff. I just want the supernatural stuff because that's fascinating. And it gets me things. He made a mistake that Jesus implicitly and explicitly condemned and tried to coach out of people all throughout his ministry. He made the mistake of taking something that had eternal, transcendent kingdom value and trying to cash it out and convert it into something that had world value instead of the other way around like Jesus was constantly teaching. What he was saying was you're supposed to take stuff that you can't keep, things that only exist in this physical world and maybe have some value here but won't last, and gradually convert that stuff into things you can keep. 
things that have eternal value, things that won't rust out or get eaten by moths or fall apart. Simon's a great example of what a sort of convert looks like, and this really shouldn't do anything to undermine the credibility of the evangelistic effort that happened and is recorded here in Acts 8 in Samaria. Because way back in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus clearly set expectations for the disciples that not everybody's going to respond the same way to these things. And three quarters of the types of responses you're going to get when you talk about the message of the kingdom are going to end up being generally negative. He told a parable about a sower and some seeds that he sowed and the different kinds of soil that it fell on. And there are four types of soil and only one really had the seeds take and grow up into something that was useful and produced a harvest. Everything else kind of fell on a spectrum between it's totally not going to work out at all and fall on bad soil and it's going to start to look good but get kind of choked out and not work for a variety of reasons. Jesus said this kind of stuff would happen and hey, it happened. And nothing here that should be really rattling or confusing or destructive. This was predicted. Simon made his choice, responded to it the way he wanted to and I don't know, you hope it turned out well for him in the end, but we don't know what happened to the guy next. Final observation. The Holy Spirit seems to be becoming more and more of a front and center character in this thing. The word spirit is something we often associate with vagueness, but here it's not vague. The Holy Spirit is a character with defined personality traits, a clear agenda. This is God's presence at this time. Jesus had kind of been the representative a few weeks, months back. But now it's the Holy Spirit. This is God at work. And we're starting to learn some things about who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit is up to. And here are some specifics that I think we've learned about the Holy Spirit through seven full chapters and change into the book of Acts. First, he has an agenda and he behaves a certain way. He's clearly in on the plan to preserve the church, to take care of them and make sure they get through this early phase of their existence intact. He has an agenda, but like anybody who has an agenda, at times the Holy Spirit seems to be using different techniques to see his plan realized. And as we see the Holy Spirit use all of these different approaches, be they miraculous or otherwise, it's easy for us to start to think that, wow, this is probably just prescriptive. This is all normative forever. But the Holy Spirit's choices and what he chooses to do to realize his plan varies even within the book of Acts. It's very hard to say, man, if people do this, the Holy Spirit will always do this on every single thing that we see happening here. Just like I was talking about a couple episodes back, I don't view the book of Acts as being prescriptive for what God is obligated to do forever. Instead, I see it as being descriptive of the techniques that God employed through the Holy Spirit during this time to accomplish these purposes. We also see that the Spirit is clearly committed to the grand divine plan of redemption that permeates the whole Bible. Stuff went to garbage. We exist in a fallen world. We are fallen people. But God has set out to make the thing better through an elaborate redemptive plan. And the Holy Spirit is playing a key role and is doing his part to see this whole thing through that we're reading about really in the entire Bible. Additionally, we figured out that the Holy Spirit is personal, even though our first instinct might be to think, boy, that doesn't seem very personal, it's just a spirit. But as we learn more about theology from the Bible, we discover that this really is the aspect of God who we meet as people. This is the point at which we connect with God. The Holy Spirit is what the Bible says God gives to people who believe in him and follow him and who are followers of Christ. And so the forgiveness that people can receive through Christ's work on the cross is something that we receive from God, but kind of the presence of God as we come to know God is the Holy Spirit. So this is actually a very personal expression of God in every sense of the word. The same deity who we're reading about here from 2,000 years ago who did all this miraculous stuff is the exact same deity who indwells Christians today. Finally, God and Jesus continue to be active, but the Holy Spirit we're coming to understand is kind of in the hands-on position right now as it pertains to the age of the church that we read about here and that's still going on to this day. There's a lot to think about in this passage. I hope you don't feel completely overwhelmed. I've had a lot of fun preparing it. I really appreciate you being a part. My goal with every single episode is to try to do great work, to research the thing well, to communicate it in a way that's kind of fun and maybe make some sense while I'm at it. If I've done that and you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, I would be really grateful if you would give it a shot. I'm Matt Whitman. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour.